What is up, everybody, and welcome to the Theology and Worship Podcast. We exist to equip worshipers for spirit and truth worship. Hey, guys, just got back from Nepal. I spent 15 days in the country of Nepal. About half of those days were spent in the great city of Kathmandu, and the other half were spent on the other side of Nepal, the east side of Nepal, in a village called Chepawa. Our primary objective was to break ground on the soccer field project. The last podcast kind of explains uh, a little bit about what's going on, but just to kind of elaborate on it, we basically had to get a third-party nonprofit involved called Nelos. A third-party nonprofit is going to basically manage the project on Nepal's side and make sure that it happens because we're not there, right? We're in Texas. So we're a little bit uh, on the other side of the globe. (laughs) So it's hard to make sure that things get done. So we went... And we signed contracts with them and had long conversations with them. Of course, they were talking in uh, Nepali and Lomi, these languages I don't understand. So I was just kind of there hanging out. Then uh, a few days later, we began the journey to the Chepawa village. The Chepawa village is basically located on the east side of the Himalayan mountain range. It's at 14,000 feet. To get to it, you have to fly a plane from Kathmandu to the east side of Nepal, a small plane. And that was one of the most surreal experiences of my entire life because you could, you were just like eye level with the whole Himalayan mountain range. And it was beautiful that day, not a cloud uh, in the sky. And I could see every mountain. I found Everest with the help of some of the locals on the plane. And it was just, it was, I couldn't take my eyes off of it. It was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. So Then you come down into, um, I can't even remember what the city is called, but it's this jungle kind of little town. And from there, it's a Jeep ride, full day, about 10 hour Jeep ride north. The Jeep gets you as far as you can go. And then you've got about, you know, a 10 mile hike over, you know, an elevation of, you know, 15,000 feet or something. And basically, the plan was to make that in one day. And we're staying in these hostels along the way. And these hostels are really just these brick buildings um, with, you know, boards or benches that you basically, you know, get your sleeping bag together and just sleep there, pass out. It's so cold, by the way. Uh, it was cold the entire trip, but, you know, it was fine. Um, and we began the journey. You cross this, like, beautiful bridge and you're crossing this huge river. And then you just start going up the mountain. And you are going up. Like, it is like an intense uh, angle the entire time. It's like you're doing box jumps as, as the way Anthony kind of explained it, who's the filmographer who went with us. Not only that, but we're carrying on our backs all the camera equipment, um, too much of camera equipment, stuff we didn't even end up using. Uh, if I could do it again, less stuff would be the, the goal. But we, we basically are trying to make it like we can see all the way on the mountain this silver like rooftop. And that's where we're trying to make it. That'll be the halfway point where we can stop and get food. And, um, you know, I basically have these three huge takeaways, um, that I got from the trip and takeaway. Number one is this, you can do far more than what you thought yourself capable because reaching that halfway point was the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. And there were so many times that I just wanted to quit. And we were supposed to make it to the halfway point within six or seven hours. And we did not make it to the halfway point till about 12 hours. That's, that's how hard this was. I had muscle cramps in both legs. Both quads were you know, interchangeably uh, cramping up bad to where I could not move. My hamstrings were cramping up. Then my calves began to cramp up because it's, my body is just not used to this eight hours of vigorous labor. Um, when we got to about a third of the way, we refilled waters. And I had a camel back because I thought that's what I needed to do. But I did not need that. It was too much weight. And not only that, but I took some of the camera equipment and that from one third to one half of the journey was, it was excruciatingly difficult. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. And I just realized in that moment that my body is capable of more than I think because it wanted to shut down. And my brain was saying no more, but I just kept on going, uh, covered in sweat, uh, you know, from head to toe, just cold and wet because of sweat. And, and I just kept on going.
we ended up paying some locals to carry our bags, which is funny because I had a bag, Anthony had a bag, and Noah had a bag, and one local carried all of them. <laughs> so they're just, their bodies are built for this. They would go up and down that mountain every single day. But that halfway point, you know, we finally hit there and they gave us food. I couldn't eat. I was nauseous. I was dehydrated, even though I had drunk so much water, but I was just sweating that much and I just couldn't even eat, which is bad. If you've ever been hiking, you need to, you need to be replenishing calories. And then from the halfway point to the top of the mountain, which is another two hours it took us, which is too long. Um, but it was literally the most excruciating pain I've ever experienced, the hardest I've ever pushed my body. And we just kept on going and we made it. And when we got to the peak of the mountain, it was this like, like realization, I can do so much more than I think I can do. And I think that, you know, God allows us to get to these breaking points to where we think we can't go on any longer because he wants to show us what we're made of. And this is just... This is just true for life. No matter where you find yourself today, as you're listening to this, you can do so much more than you think you can do. I've just kind of retrained my brain to say, I can handle all of this and one more, all of this and one more. And on the mountain, I was just reciting this, all of this and one more, one more step, one more step, keep on going, keep on going. And there were these markers on the mountain, these rocks stacked up. And every time I saw one of those, it was a reminder to me that I can keep on going. There's more in the tank. I have what it takes. God has called me to this. I was thinking of like Ephesians 2.10, you know, we are his workmanship created for these good works that he has preordained that we might walk in them one step after another as we got to the top of the mountain. I'm filled with adrenaline. We ran down. I mean, we, we just grinded. It was snowing. It was pitch black. We were just by the light of our iPhones. And we just ran down that mountain because at that point, our legs were numb. The cramps had gone away. And we just realized like, we can handle this. Like we can do this. So that's takeaway number one. Takeaway number two is true joy cannot be touched by circumstance. Um, when we got to the Chippewa village the next day, because it did take us a whole day longer than we had anticipated, it took us about 15, 16 hours to get there. Um, and when I woke up that next day and began the trek up the next mountain, oh my gosh, my legs were killing me. My knees were done, but one foot ahead of the other, we just got there. And we got to Chippewa and it's just this beautiful, simple life, farming and taking care of chickens and goats. And they're just people are so happy and content. And I realized that what I would call tough circumstances, like didn't have toilets, right? What I would call unlivable situations, you know, they don't have insulation. It's freezing cold at night, you know, in that they had found a joy that I hadn't even fully realized yet. And so takeaway number two for me is that true joy, it just cannot be touched by circumstance. It's not circumstantial. The more status we have, it's not going to bring joy. The more, uh, you know, titles we have or money we make, it's not going to bring, the more stuff we accumulate, it's not going to bring true joy. True joy comes from worship. It comes from being in relationship, being connected to God and living in what he's called you to do. Like pushing through the hard thing of climbing that mountain to get to where we had to go to accomplish the task that God had given us to accomplish. Like I was so full of joy and gratitude. I was grateful to my wife for taking care of my kids. I was grateful for my kids because their smiles were on my mind and on my heart. I was thankful for my pastor, you know, who had relieved me for 15 days to go and do this really difficult thing. I was thankful for the team that kept Shoreline just going and I didn't have to worry about it all. Like I was filled with gratitude. Out of this gratitude came this true joy. And though I'm like, every, I'm wearing every article of clothing I could possibly wear and I'm in a mummy sleeping bag and I've got that thing pulled as tight as it will go and I'm freezing there was still this true joy of being smack dab in the center of where God wanted me to be and traversing the hard ground to get there. And it was just an exhale of worship. 
It was just an exhale of worship that came out of that and true joy. And now that I'm back in the States and, you know, trying to figure out what time zone it is and all that, you know, I'm just so thankful. Like my, my, my two, th- my three-year-old, you know, threw a fit and I'm just like, man, I'm so thankful for your passion and your zeal, your zeal. Uh, and my six-year-old, my seven-year-old is feeling all the feels. And I'm like, I'm so, pa- I'm so thankful for your empathy and your, just that you feel every moment. And my wife, as she's kind of like bearing the stress of being without me, I'm just so thankful for you for how strong you are to carry what you've carried. True joy, man, it cannot be touched by circumstance. And number three is this, man, we Americans live in a great country. We just really, really do. Um, As I was going through, you know, customs and, uh, you know, all the luggage checks and as I'm getting into the city of Kathmandu and, you know, they don't have street lights or stop signs. It's just complete, you know, some kind of synergized chaos. You know, I just came to realize like, man, we have it so good here. Like if we fail at creating disciples, if we fail at continuing the work of making it on earth as heaven, we only have ourselves to blame because the obstacles here they just pale in comparison to the obstacles everywhere else. And Kathmandu, you know, it was really fun to be there because everything costs so little, right? I mean, we could feed seven people for, you know, $12, 12 American dollars and eat well, you know? Um, but you, you have to understand that things cost that much because that's what people can afford, and the way that the government is, and I'm not going to say anything bad about it because this, the, you know, the city of Kathmandu was amazing and the, the country of Nepal is beautiful and the people are breathtaking and overwhelming, uh, overwhelmingly joyful in comparison to myself. But I just realized like they have more obstacles to overcome than we do. And so we are without excuse. We are without excuse. We have to make it on earth as it is in heaven. We have to be giving our lives for the gospel, laying our life down that we might find the life that Jesus has for us. And the obstacles that we face, they're just small in comparison, at least for me. I'm not trying to make trivial what you experience and what you go through, but man, for me, the calling is so clear. Go to all the earth and make disciples be his witnesses in Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Like, man, we get to do that here without obstacle, without condition, tax exempt. You know what I mean? Like, this is the beauty of America. And I'm not saying that it's bad to be here. No, it's great to be here. Because the closer that earth gets to heaven, the closer that we get to a place without poverty and a place without tears and a place without sickness, that's the ideal, right? That's why we're here. That's what it means to bring heaven to earth. But it's good for us to look soberly and see not all places are like this. You know, Nepal is less than 5% Christian. It's 90% Buddhist and Hindu. The gospel is not, it's not there in, in, in entirety yet. And so there's more work to do. And I know there are many places in the world that are still like that. So those are my big three takeaways. You can do far more than what you thought yourself capable. True joy cannot be touched by circumstance. And we live in a great country. So let's get to work. Let's get to work and let's worship the God who has given us the ability to continue on going.